Good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, uh, wherever you happen to be in the world. Thanks for joining us today for our, our Blazor 101 topic. Uh, my name is Mike McKechnie. I'll be your uh, MC today. Uh, Vincent Bai, who joins us from the Netherlands. Uh, he's a, a cloud solution architect for Microsoft in the Netherlands, so he'll be our presenter today. Um, just a reminder, this is a, um, first of all, it's going to be recorded. So um, while none of your contact information is will be in the recording, if uh, um, uh, if you do reply or put anything in, in the chat, that will be recorded as well. So just just so you're aware. Um, and second is that this is a reminder. This is a first of a three part series. I'm going to put the other two in the chat for you here. Um, if you are not registered for these, please certainly uh, you can use those uh, use those links to join us uh, on those days as we go deeper into uh, into what Blazor has to offer for us, uh, and then also kind of integrating it with. Um, with AI, which is, you know, got to integrate everything with AI these days. So um, Vincent is also, uh, in addition to just not just being a great guy all over, um, he is also the main contributor and maintainer of a uh, Fluent UI um, library for Blazor as well. So I, I put the, uh, the the link to his, uh, to his libraries uh, on GitHub uh, in the chat as well. So without any further ado, I will hand it over to you, Vincent, to get us started. So thank you. Thank you, Michael, for these kind words. And hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, like uh, Michael said, I recently moved out of the uh, West Midwest region into what is now called the International CSU. Uh, but uh, yeah, we're still having close contact, of course, with uh, everyone in the region. Uh, so that's why we're still going uh, through with these uh, series of laser talks. Um, for the rest of this uh, presentation, I'll be uh, shutting down my camera to give as much room <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to the presentation as uh, possible. So let's get started. Um, yeah, what is Blazor and, and why should you use it? Oh, by the way, if you have any uh, questions uh, or uh, comments, uh, please uh, make them uh, known in the chat uh, because I believe most of your um, microphones are going to be muted throughout this uh, presentation. So let's take a step back first and understand how we develop web applications today. Uh, it's uh, we build rich web environments to run on desktop and mobiles. Uh, there's there's lots of interaction, dynamic elements with video and audio, uh, user generated content, uh, uh, external content, and and whatever more that needs to be shown on the page. Uh, and then again, it all needs to be fast and responsive as well. So it needs to work on uh, as many devices as possible. And for client side development, we are used to do that with JavaScript frameworks like Angular, React or Vue. And uh, there's no doubt that these JavaScript frameworks have dominated the client side development for a while now. Uh, on the other hand, for server-side development, we use programming languages like C Sharp or PHP or Java uh, or, or whatever, Node maybe even. Uh, but to build successful and, and resilient uh, and, and cloud-native software these days, it's inevitable that you need to do both of this uh, server-side and client-side development. But yeah, uh, what's the fun in, in learning uh, two different sets of programming languages and framework? And wouldn't it be great if you can use uh, uh, .NET and C Sharp for both of them, uh, regardless of the program that you're currently on? And that's where Blazor comes in. Uh, Blazor lets you build interactive web UIs using C Sharp instead of JavaScript. Uh, sometimes it's said, well, you, you don't need JavaScript at all, but that's not completely true because sometimes there's APIs that are uh, available in, in modern browsers that you can only use if you use JavaScript. So then, uh, yeah, it's inevitable to use it. But it's not uh, a necessity or, or a given to do so. Uh, for, for most standard applications, you can do without JavaScript uh, 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 pretty well. And Blazor apps are composed of reusable web UI components implemented in C Sharp and, and HTML and CSS. And both the client and the server code is written in, in C Sharp. So that allows you to share uh, source code and libraries. Now, Blazor is part of the ASP.NET Core uh, framework. Uh, it's open source web development framework that extends the .NET uh, platform uh, with tools and libraries for building web apps. Now, uh, maybe some of you remember Silverlight. 
um, that's why it's uh, important to have open source uh, uh, as well, uh, because then uh, if anyone should decide that it's no longer going to be developed, then you still have all the code and you can still uh, keep running that. Another important aspect of running Blazor is that it's all built using open standards. Um, it's easy to get started. Uh, just go to the URL here and uh, install the, the SDK of your choice. There's at the moment three uh, uh, available, uh, which are no, meant here, uh, mentioned here on the on the screen. And uh, after you've done that and started up your uh, favorite uh, programming environment, you can uh, start writing C# -sharp code that can be executed both on the server and in the client browser. So that means that if you're already a net developer, you can reuse your C# -sharp skills. Uh, you don't have to learn any new JavaScript frameworks or uh, worry about the learning curves or staying up to date with the uh, the, the, the latest uh, package of the of the day in uh, what what's now the popular JavaScript network or framework. Sorry, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's quite easy to get started. Uh, it has already been around for uh, more than five years, so it's it's very mature. Uh, but with every new version and specifically also again with the .NET 8 version that's uh, uh, almost around the corner, uh, new functionality is is being added. So uh, yeah, start up your fire, uh, your favorite IDE and uh, and get started. So how does it work? Uh, at this point, you might be thinking, but browsers, they only understand and execute JavaScript. Uh, how in the world can I execute C sharp code in the in the browser? Well, that's where uh, WebAssembly comes in. And uh, that's one part of the answer. Blazor can run the c -sharp code directly in the browser by using WebAssembly. And uh, that runs in the same security sandbox, just like any other JavaScript framework, uh, like Angular or React. Uh, and it uses a, a shadow DOM. So that's uh, uh, something that's besides the actual uh, document opt-in model that's, that's known in the browser uh, that is being used for um, yeah, keeping up with the changes that are happening on the on the client side. And it's not just C sharp, but in fact, any type of code that can be compiled to WebAssembly uh, can be run in a browser in uh, in that way. Now, there's actually also uh, other options to host uh, Blazor applications, and the other one is uh, a Blazor server, and we'll discuss more uh, on that in uh, in a bit. But first, let's zoom in on uh, WebAssembly a little bit. So uh, WebAssembly, or WASM for short, is, is based on open standard. It's uh, by now a native part of all modern browsers, including mobile browsers. So there's yeah, basically no uh, issues with running that on, on any type of uh, uh, device. Um, and yeah, it, like I said, it enables you to run .NET libraries directly in the browser using just these open standards. There's no extensions required, so again, uh, completely different than what we had uh, in the past with Silverlight. It just runs on the on the bare metal of your uh, of your machine or device, and everything that the application needs, like the compiled application code, but also dependencies on the .NET runtime, etc., is all downloaded to the browser automatically and stored in the uh, in the cache of the of the browser uh, to get better performance, of course. Now, Blazor is a full stack solution for building that web UI with .NET and C Sharp. Um, and you can run those web WASM uh, applications uh, purely on the client side uh, using a, a WebAssembly based uh, .NET runtime. Um, sometimes you also hear it referred to as the client side hosting model. Blazor server, which is also known as the server-side hosting model, leverage the web server to execute your application. Uh, as you can see in the uh, in the slide here, there's a, uh, a signal R connection, uh, which is being set up and established once the uh, application starts up. Uh, the app is executed on the server, and it uses that signal R connection to send updates back and forth. Uh, so for example, when a user clicks a button in the app, the information about that event is sent to the server over the signal R connection. The server then handles that event. Uh, it calculates the difference between the before and after situation and generates the HTML that, that represents that. And then that difference is sent back to the browser 
and uh, Blazor makes sure that the UI is then updated uh, uh, through the DOM. So you might wonder why there's a star in this uh, in this title because there's actually way more ways to host and render Blazor applications, and we'll talk about those here right now. Uh, for example, one of the other ones that we have is Blazor Hybrid. So that's a third uh, model that we have to host uh, Blazor, application, Blazor applications. And with Blazor Hybrid, you can build apps that run uh, natively on, on cross-platform devices. So it supports .NET MAUI, uh, WPF, Windows Form, and even Samsung's Tizen platform, which is used in smart TVs and, and uh, before that also in, in smartwatches. And that works by having a, a native component on all these platforms called the Blazor WebView. And that Blazor WebView is basically the, uh, yeah, the entry port within that platform to use the, the native device capabilities, but also run uh, the Blazor components that, uh, that are being created. And there's no difference between the components that you would be seeing on the server side or on the client side model or that, uh, uh, that hybrid model. So, that allows for even greater reuse of components and, and source code. Um, letting those native applications out of, uh, out of mind for a second. Uh, if you look at the server and the WebAssembly models, then you need to make a choice on which hosting model you would like to use. Now, in general, Blazor uh, embraces a single page application architecture, so it rewrites the same page dynamically in response to uh, your user actions. And uh, since only the differences then apply to the update UI, the application feels faster and more responsive to the user. And to get the best out of the best uh, options that are there, you need to choose that hosting model. Uh, and that depends on a number of factors which are um, summarized here on this slide. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think the most important differences are uh, with Blazor Server, you have full access to all the server capabilities, uh, but it's also very fast to uh, to start up. Uh, uh, nothing needs to be downloaded except the HTML code for the for the site or the page. Um, all the code remains on the server. On the other hand, with WebAssembly, uh, yeah, that takes a little bit longer because all those client assemblies have to be downloaded first. Uh, that also means that code is leaving the server and, and streamed down to the client. So if you have any kind of code that you want to keep a secret, uh, then using WebAssembly is kind of out of the uh, uh, out of order because, yeah, that's not going to uh, safeguard that, that code from uh, prying eyes. Uh, once it's downloaded, which yeah, of course takes a, a bit because there's there's uh, a significant amount of of code that needs to be downloaded. Although that's getting smaller with every version of Blazor, uh, but once it's downloaded, it, it all runs fully client side, and that means that you can use the full capabilities and and power and performance of the uh, uh, of the, the the hardware that is running on. So with a server, you're kind of well, limited is maybe a, a, a bit too restrictive because there's like, I don't know, five to 10,000 users per server that uh, Blazor server can handle uh, um, uh, easily. Uh, but yeah, it all needs to run for those, all those clients on the server at the same time. Whereas with WebAssembly, of course, every uh, user is running on its own hardware. So there's virtually no limit on uh, on how many users you can have. And of course, on the server side, that can be mitigated with uh, with adding more servers. But if you don't want to make a choice, then uh, yeah, with Blazor in .NET 8, it's going to be possible to kind of mix and match that server side, client side hosted components, uh, and you can even mix that up with statically rendered components, like yeah, components that that put something on the screen but don't have any interactivity. Uh, so that's just a matter of sending the HTML to the client and then be done with it. And I say you might uh, on this slide because there's uh, still situations where you would be restricted for using only one of the modes. Uh, think of a slow network or, or um, uh, code that cannot be copied to the client, like I said uh, earlier about the secrets. Uh, that might uh, uh, push you to make a choice for one of the more uh, traditional Blazor hosting, uh, Blazor hosting models that are already out there. Now this uh, this this uh, mix of random modes and this auto random mode that I think that's one of the uh, pivotal changes that we'll see with .NET 8. Uh, at the moment we're at uh, preview seven, 
Uh, that means that the next version will be release candidate one. And then all the way up to November, there's a new version uh, released every month with uh, general availability of .NET 8 in uh, November with the .NET conference that is being held. If you carefully looked at all the uh, images that were shown uh, earlier, then you might have seen that, uh, uh, and you can see it again here in this slide, uh, that every uh, kind of per, uh, yeah, per perception of Blazor that is shown here uh, shows Razor components. Uh, and it doesn't matter on which model of hosting model you are using. These components are always there um, to build up the UI. And these are components that can be shared, uh, not only by the different hosting modes, but also by different applications. So in that sense, you can think of component libraries where a number of components are being gathered together. Uh, you just include that library in your project and you have all kinds of uh, functionality available out of the box. Now, everything in a web page can be a component. And in fact, if you look at the code that we're going to see later, uh, then you can even see that the page itself is a, a component. And that's very similar to kind of what uh, React and Vue have with their component models. Uh, what the difference, of course, is that this one uses dot razor as a file suffix. Um, it has a life cycle. It can be hooked on to. It supports routing, uh, and they can be in a recursive structure. So they uh, allow you to build up complex UIs with uh, uh, different building blocks. This is different from Razor pages that we've seen in earlier uh, versions of uh, .NET, ASP.NET, um, which were then used to uh, replace view and controllers in MVC. And they generally get data from a model and display them using some templating syntax. Uh, but that's not how it works here. We're just reusing the, uh, the already, um, well, I say older uh, uh, a Razor syntax that has been uh, created for those Razor pages and before. .NET always had a rich ecosystem of partners building additional tools and controls and to help you build those, uh, those full featured applications faster. And uh, we already have many partners that support Blazor with component libraries uh, and build uh, uh, support into their tools and controls for uh, today as well. The months mentioned on this slide um, all have con well, very good and complete and great component libraries available. Uh, but the ones that are mentioned here are all having more or less commercial uh, offering and license model. So you either need to pay for support or you need to pay for the, the library itself or whatever. Uh, but there's always a commercial part uh, that needs to be taken care of. On the other hand, there's also, of course, um, uh, a creative or oh, big open source uh, ecosystem uh, where you can find uh, also very high quality uh, component libraries. Uh, the, the, the sad thing is they haven't been so creative on the naming of the libraries because they, they all have one way of uh, Blazor in there. Um, and if you follow the link that is shown on this page um, or on this slide, then you can go to a, to, yeah, a big library page that lists all these component libraries, both commercial and non-commercial. Uh, but this is definitely not uh, a definitive set. There's, there's, there's way more and many more uh, available. So in summary, uh, before we can go to, uh, to coding, uh, you can build full stack web applications with, uh, with Blazor. Um, they are ready for production use. They are already used in production use. Um, there's not, it's, the Blazor is typically not a system that you can say like, oh, this site is running Blazor, because it's mostly because of the, 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 the strong tie into .NET used for line of business applications. So for example, internally within Microsoft, we have a number of big applications that are running on Blazor, but yeah, that's not something that you see in, 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 in the day-to-day -day surfing of the internet. Uh, and there's, there's many more companies that are doing that. One of the other uh, great tenets of uh, uh, Blazor is that you can easily build uh, uh, progressive web applications with it uh, that are installable and, and can do all these things that are mentioned on this slide. So that's another plus of using this, uh, this model. Um, follow these links if you want to know more or get, uh, get your hands dirty on some code that's, uh, that's out there. Just one more thing uh, that I wanted to mention, uh, and I already mentioned it before. So .NET 8 is, is uh, moving along nicely. 
Uh, and with that uh, new version of Blazor is coming out as well. Uh, and this uh, slide highlights some of the uh, yeah of the, of the points that are being introduced there. Uh, the server side rendering we're going to take a look at later, also the streaming rendering and the section support. Uh, but yeah, there's there's many more things like a, a, a grid and a, a automatically switching, etc. Uh, that are really good and uh, yeah, good new opportunities that come with using the Blazor platform. All right, let's move on to uh, the demos and uh, dive into some actual code. Um, let me pause for one second and see if there are any questions uh, that someone would like to ask at this time. And if not, I'll move on to the next part. I don't see any questions in the chat. No, me neither. OK, then we'll just uh, move on. So oh, share just my one, one just in. So components like libraries, services, etc., all in one. That's the uh, they they can be they can be, uh, but it's more like it's it's more you can more see it as a building block of uh, these kinds of libraries and and services. So no, normally you can combine or you would combine multiple components uh, into one library and. Um, the services, etc. If you're talking, for example, uh, or if you're thinking, for example, about API calls, uh, that's that's more code that would be running on the server side, or or at least uh, yeah, navigating to a server. Uh, that code can, of course, also be part of a component library, uh, but it's yeah, it's not something that you would put on a page for somebody to see. So it's more something that would be called from a component. Yeah, so uh, a repository service, uh, uh, like a follow-up question here. Uh, okay, makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, I've uh, switched to a different screen here, which is uh, the Visual Studio um, that I'm running, where I'm going to be doing these Blazor demos. Um, it's a completely empty solution. Just has has some uh, things for me that I uh, know that I'm going to need later on. Uh, but yeah, let's just start and uh, go add some stuff to this uh, solution to see some actual code. So in this uh, Visual Studio, I'm not going to go into how Visual Studio works, etc. I, I take that as a given that everyone knows how that works. Uh, I'll also be showing uh, how you can do stuff from the command line later on and with Visual Studio code. Um, but we're not going to go into the workings of uh, uh, of the actual programs that much. So within this solution, I'm going to say that I want to add a new project. And within the project dialog, the new project dialog, I can filter on uh, Blazor projects. And in this case, I'll say I'll just want to add a Blazor server application. And double click that. Uh, need to give it a name. So let's give it the imaginary name server. Just go with next. Uh, we'll use .NET 7 for this one. and accept all the other defaults and just say create. Now, uh, as a rehash uh, with a server application, there's not going to be anything uh, downloaded like uh, .NET code to the, to the client. So everything is going to be run on the server. And if I just run this application that's uh, out of the, fresh out of the template, uh, nothing changed. Um, we'll run it in a second, but first let's take a, a look at the, uh, the structure of, of such a project. So basically what you see is uh, the components uh, which have the dot razor extension are being used uh, throughout the site. Um, so like I said, even the, the, the pages that you are visiting in the site, like this index dot razor is a component. Uh, and this is the, the source code that's in there. You can see the components, other components being called here like HTML uh, fragments, but also like the page title or the survey prompt which are actually other components being hooked into this uh, this page. Uh, so there you can see that kind of recursive structure being uh, set up where one component calls in other components, etc. But like I said, all these things are uh, components. Uh, there's of course also uh, some code in the program.cs where everything is is hooked up uh, to the to the web application. Um, we're not going to go into that for today because that's a little bit more advanced, but 
um, yeah, it's there generated with the template, so that will just work. Uh, one other thing that you see in this project is that we have this data folder, and this kind of has a uh, service that will be injected into the uh, the program, uh, and that will then be used on the uh, fetch data page to get uh, information out of that service. And because this is all running on the on the server, you can call those web services immediately on and run them on the server itself. Okay, let's just uh, start up this application and see what's happening. Uh, first, of course, it all needs to be compiled, and that's done pretty quickly. And then in your browser, you'll get uh, something like this. Um, maybe if you've if you've heard or seen anything about Blazor, this looks a little bit familiar. Uh, this template hasn't really changed for the last five years. It's using Bootstrap. Um, and I think it's due for a refresh, but yeah, it, it, on the other hand, it's it's recognizable uh, and clear, and it does what it uh, says on the tin, so it's good for that. Um, so we're looking at the home page now, uh, where you can see that the page title is is being set on the oh sorry on the tab here. Um, we also saw that survey prompt. That's this component that's rendered here on the page. And if we go to the counter page, for example, we see a button, and if I click that then the counter gets incremented. The other page that's there is the fetch data, uh, which uses that, uh, that service to get data about current weather forecasts uh, and put that in a table. It's of course all fictional data, so don't uh, take note of the temperatures, et cetera, and, uh, and the summaries that are sh shared on the screen. Now, if we go into what the web tools of the browser, uh, and we go to the application, we can see that nothing has been stored here. So no DLLs, no .NET code has been uh, downloaded. Even if I uh, refresh this, we won't see anything here. So it's still completely running on the server. Um, and if you remember, also one of the things that I said is that it's using a WebSocket to push information uh, back and forth uh, to the server with the Signal R connection. And that's actually the one that's uh, showing up here. And if I clear the uh, messages that were sent before and I go into the counter page and I do a click me call, you can see that the um, event is being translated into a message. It's uh, transported with, with the WebSocket to the server. Uh, the server handles it and sends back a reply, all within these very small uh, number of bytes that are being transferred back and forth. And you can even look at those messages and see Kind of what kind of code uh, it's uh, sending uh, uh, back and forth from that uh, from that server. Now, that's of course not really interesting, but uh, what is interesting to see is that you can see here that it's not sending the complete page, but just uh, that message with uh, what needs to be updated, etc. Um, just go here. OK, one of the other things that is interesting to note here, and like I said, everything is a component, even the pages are components, um, and it also supports routing. So what you can see here is that we have like the, the counter page, which has a route uh, counter. Uh, for home, it has nothing, and for fetch data, it has fetch data. So just keep that in mind, and then close this and go back to the application. Um, and here you can see in the component that it has been given that page directive with the fetch data. So that basically determines the route for this component. And that's actually the only difference that you have between a page and a component. Uh, a page has this page directive with a, with a route uh, and another component like, for example, the uh, not menu doesn't have that. So that is just uh, not having that page at the root. And that's the only difference between uh, a component being a page or or not. All right, so far for the uh, for the server project, and now let's uh, close this one up. And in that same project, I'm now going to be adding uh, another project, uh, and this guy this time I'll be choosing the WebAssembly uh, project. So let's use this one and give it the name client. 
And for this one, um, I'm also going to go with the defaults, except in the framework, I'm not going to go with .NET 7, but I'm going to be using the .NET 8 preview, so the latest and greatest uh, new version. Uh, this preview has been released, um, I don't know, maybe one and a half weeks ago, so it's pretty new. Uh, currently, we are at preview 7. I'm just going to go ahead and create this uh, this project and say that this is the one that uh, it needs to start up if I want to run it. And uh, yeah, basically, if you if you look at that source code and compare it to what we already had, uh, you won't find that many uh, differences because it is uh, actually running the same kind of code. And like I said, those that code can be uh, exchanged between client and server projects and uh, running these or having these two templates kind of side by side uh, shows that uh, firsthand uh, because this is the counter page uh, uh, that I have in the uh, in the server uh, in the client project, and I can just say okay, let's compare this with the counter that we have in the server project in the pages folder, and yeah, there's absolutely no difference. It's exactly the same component, and normally what you would do. If you have these kinds of projects where you would like to share this with between those different types of applications, uh, you could create a third project, say a library project or whatever, uh, and put that counter uh, component in there and then reuse it uh, and, and kind of reshare that code without uh, maintaining it at different places. OK, I set it as the, uh, the startup project um, and let's go run that. Um, Oh, it wouldn't be a big surprise probably if uh, if you look at the template that it's going to look exactly the same. Huh? It's also uh, based out of the uh, of the template, so it uses the same bootstrap uh, look and feel, and it also has the same pages in there. Um, so I can go here to the counter, I can uh, increment the counter, I can go to the fetch data and have that same uh, information available uh, there as on the other side. The difference here, however, is if I go uh, again into the uh, the dev tools uh, and now go look at the application or maybe even uh, first look at the network. Um, so if I re refresh this page, you see there's no, well, there is a WebSocket, but that's just for the development environment. So there's no uh, signal or WebSocket that we saw on the server side. This is just here for the, for the client. Did I stop it? Oh, it's still running. Uh, but these two, yeah, these are for uh, for the development environments. Now, on the other hand, if we go to the application tab, we can see that uh, uh, a big chunk of data has been downloaded uh, into the storage for this uh, for this application, and this is actually all the .NET code being downloaded and being run here uh, on the client side. And to kind of show uh, what that looks like and how it's downloaded, I'm going to say clear the site data here. Uh, go back to the network tab and show everything. And now if I do a full refresh, you see not only uh, the site code being downloaded, like the CSSs and, 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 the, and the HTML and the images, etc., but also all the DLLs that contain the actual .NET code uh, are being downloaded into the browser. And now this application storage is being used again. You see here that they have a .wasm extension. Uh, that's a new format that's being used for .NET 8, uh, but with, with uh, versions before that, they were actually uh, plain old DLL files. Uh, but this new WASM format, it's still a DLL, uh, but all the Windows-specific DLL information has been stripped. Uh, so you um, should have less uh, issues with certain firewall appliances or stuff like that uh, blocking these downloads because yeah, they would think, hey, this is a Windows uh, DLL. Uh, you're not allowed to do that where it's just a, a regular part of the .NET framework. So that's a new format that's being supported and that makes it uh, yeah, more resilient for those kinds of things. But as you can see, everything's being downloaded. Um, of course, this is a debug version of the application, so nothing has been trimmed or, or sh uh, tree shaken or whatever kind of technologies that you have. So it's like 24 uh, megabytes that's downloaded. That, that sounds like a lot and that is a lot, but for, uh, yeah, it's now basically downloading the whole .NET runtime. Uh, if you publish it and do a, um, uh, a published action, uh, that will be way, way less. And I think for .NET 8 now, we are around one megabyte for the whole um, 
runtime that needs to be downloaded. So even if you're running it on a mobile, it's it's very much uh, yeah doable right now with the uh, with the amount of data that needs to be downloaded. Vincent, while you're taking a breath there, we do have a question in the chat. It says, uh, can you talk about the differences in how server app components retrieve data versus how WASM app components retrieve data, i.e. direct retrieval server side and via HTTP for WASM? Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, and that, that's exactly the difference that is there. Uh, I mean, if it's running on the server, it can tap into the full capabilities of the, of the .NET framework, uh, sorry, .NET uh, uh, library that you have, the .NET runtime. Um, so doing uh, stuff directly on the database or uh, whatever uh, kind of way that you want to get the data is, is possible. If you're going to do it from the client side, you will always have to use some kind of API like a REST service or um, I don't know, uh, SOAP services, whatever. Uh, but you have to use like that kind of intermediate layer to get the data into the uh, into the client application. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So um, I'm going to reuse some parts of this project. So let me just prepare that and delete these files. Uh, I think that's it. And Let's change gears a little bit and 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 uh, not use uh, Visual Studio for uh, for a second. Um, so let's just go to my command prompt and now let's uh, do a new uh, project in in here. Uh, and that's actually the the .NET 8 template that is now the, the going to be the standard template. Uh, and that's just going to be called a .NET uh, Web app. It's not going to be a server app. It's not going to be a client app. It's just going to be a uh, web app. Uh, let me first do the clean screen. And in this uh, directory where I have my solution, I'll just say .NET new, and then it's called Blazor. Uh, before it was called a Blazor server or Blazor wasm, um, and we'll output that to the web app directory. And template has now been created. Uh, created. I'm also going to be adding it to my a solution for later. Let's do that like that. Uh, and then uh, I can just go into my uh, web app directory and uh, start uh, my uh, Visual Studio code in there. And well, you see that the kind of structure that has been created for this application is, is about the same. Um, I'm not having the counter page because in the standard template uh, you don't get any interactivity uh, because with this new standard template uh, the default render mode for Blazor will be server side rendering so it's not going to be uh, not to be confused with server side uh, server rendering or server hosting model but this is actually server side rendering so that means it's run on the server, the HTML is generated on the server, and that is a, a static HTML that's then sent back to the client. Um, and I could say, for example, that I want to have like a new uh, component in here, call that hello.razor. And we're going to need to put some code in there. So this is just basically an HTML app. Uh, but it does have some uh, um, uh, some .NET code in there that's being run uh, through Razor. Uh, in my program CS, I'm going to say, okay, this is going to be like the startup component of this application. And another thing that I need to change is that for this uh, homepage, I temporarily have to need to give that a new route because otherwise it's going to complain and bitch to me that it has two uh, pages with the same route. So. Those are the only two necessary changes for the template. And now if I go to my terminal and I say run a, oh, sorry. If I go into the new terminal and let it start up and then just say uh, .net run, it's gonna run this, uh, this new template uh, inside uh, Visual Studio Code. So it's uh, starting up and you can see that that happened here. And now I can click on this link and 
in the browser, I now have this uh, this beautiful HTML based site. It's not using the uh, the bootstrap template. It's just giving me plain HTML. I haven't done any styling or whatever, uh, but this is what you get. And if I go into the uh, the browser tools again in the dev tools, uh, I can go to the application and see that no code has been downloaded. It's not running client side. It's not using those DLLs. Um, if I go to the network tab and, and refresh this page as much as I want, I'm not going to get those web services uh, or those web sockets. I'm not getting those ones that we had before, like running it from Visual Studio, uh, which are being used to keep everything up to date. It's just the, um, yeah, the local host page. And if I actually look at the source code, then <laughs> this is all that's being generated. This is the complete HTML. Well, I can't call it an application, but technically it is an application uh, that has been created and, and downloaded. And you can see that it's uh, it's server rendered, but even if I refresh, the time is updated. So the code is run on the server and the new HTML uh, is efficiently being uh, transported back into the application and, and shown on the page. So that's the uh, the new uh, hosting model that we have on the uh, uh, with.NET 8. OK, let's close that up, shut it down. We had, uh, we had one question in the chat about uh, yeah. how can you unit test? Uh, good question. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit more difficult with uh, with Blazor because you always have like this 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 interactive part where you can uh, say, for example, click and then add an attribute or to an HTML tag or or whatever. Um, but there has been uh, a, a very good uh, third party project. It's called B Unit, uh, and that has been uh, specifically created to unit test those Blazor uh, components. Uh, and that's working really well. I'm I'm also using that in the uh, in the library uh, that uh, uh, Michael mentioned. Uh, so if you could go, if you would go into the repo uh, that uh, link that was posted, then you could also find a test project uh, and actually see how those tests have been uh, set up. Um, usually, what you do is you kind of have like a a verified .html file which contains the actual um, HTML code that would be uh, rendered. Uh, and then if you run the test, you compare what you what you receive to that verified file. And yeah, if they are the same, then, uh, you know, your unit test is uh, is good. Um, and you can make that a part of your of your build pipeline to make sure that uh, you don't break anything uh, along the way. All right, did I close this? Let's move on and uh, move back to Visual Studio. So we'll uh, close down that Visual Studio code and go back in into the solution. And it, because of the action I did all in the beginning uh, by adding the the new project, uh, it's now going to ask to reload, and it's actually going to have the uh, uh, the web app project as part of the solution as well. So um, yeah, looking at that. Um, At that project, it's, it, you, you'll see it's it's almost the same uh, as what you had before with the client and the server object. Uh, you also have the pages, you have the uh, the other components in there, uh, you have the weather forecast, uh, but it's all being statically rendered, so it's not working the same. And because of that, you also, for example, don't have the counter um, component that we saw in the client and the server. That's that's not part of this project. And I can turn that on, and and that's the switch in the template. Uh, but specifically in the way that I run it now, you don't get that counter object uh, because that would require uh, interactivity, eh? uh, clicking on the button and the number needs to be updated, et cetera. So how could we do that? Well, uh, let's first undo all the other stuff that we did with this uh, the silly hello page. Uh, go back into my program and say that the app component is uh, starting up the application and what else in my index.razor i need to make this the single uh, home page again save everything and see if i didn't break anything by running it almost mm, what did i do wrong it's not what i expected Uh, 
maybe I need to rebuild. That's probably it. Oh, wait a minute. I'm. It helps if I go into this and set the web app, the startup project. I was running the client project where I deleted a bunch of stuff, so that's why it looked silly. Uh, now we should be good to go again. Yes, that's where we. So you can see now that we're running the uh, the web app template. Uh, we have the home page and the weather page, uh, but we don't have any um, counter page here. And let's first go into those uh, those browser tools again. Uh, go to the application and see that the code has been downloaded. Uh, and even if I refresh it, the, 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 there's no .NET code being downloaded. And again, also if I refresh this page and look at the uh, uh, the web services, we only see the ones from uh, the dev environment, uh, but nothing from Signal. Um, and there's also no no WASM files. So basically the same as what we had with the hello app but now with some styling uh, etc one of the other things that you can see if we go into this this weather page is that it says here loading and then automatically displays the the data once it's finished and that's one of the other new capabilities that you have with uh, .NET 8 uh, which is called streaming rendering so the page is immediately shown on the screen uh, it just doesn't have all the data yet that's why you see the loading uh, indicator. And then once all the, the, the data has been downloaded, um, yeah, it will be automatically injected into the page at the right um, part of the, uh, of the HTML. So how does that look like on the, uh, uh, on the development side? Uh, basically, all you need to do with your component is uh, add this attribute on the top at this directive. Uh, and say that it supports uh, streaming rendering. Um, question in the chat is, did the web app have Bootstrap to begin with? Yes, it did. Uh, but by adding that hello component and uh, changing the, the, say, the base route to that hello page, um, I kind of circumvented all the Bootstrap um, styling that was there. But it, it, it does have it. There's also... Um, being worked on a new template, which is called uh, the empty uh, template. And that basically just sets up the web application, but doesn't have any styling or whatever included. So that's just uh, a starting point for you to add your own uh, uh, design. And what you also see a lot with uh, uh, component libraries is that they include kind of templates that you can install um, where you basically get this, this same site with the counter page and the weather page, etc. Uh, but then uh, making use of the styling and, and components that are being included in that library. I have one for the for the Fluent UI as well. So you basically get the same site, uh, but it just looks different and uses then the uh, components that are part of that uh, of that library. Okay, so uh, let's move on uh, because we only have like ten minutes left, and I should be able to make that. Um, what we're going to do here is now make this uh, application more uh, interactive. So uh, get away and escape from the, uh, the, the uh, server-side rendering and make it more uh, of a uh, actual web application. So there's a couple of things that I need to do. Uh, at first, I want to uh, include in my uh, project for the, for the web application, I want to include that client project that we created earlier. So basically using that as a kind of component library within my web application project. I also want to enable WebAssembly to be used within this, uh, this project. Then in my program.cs, I'm going to go here and say that I want to have like these WebAssembly components. Oops, save this. Stop debugging. And also that besides my Razor components, I want to use different render modes. Well, this is all, of course, uh, going a little bit further than the, than the uh, 101. But basically what I'm saying here that I, besides using Razor components, I also want to use server-side components and, and, and WebAssembly components, and also tell the application to, uh, to add those functionalities there. Then in my imports razor, I need to say that I want to use this uh, this client project and everything that's that's defined in there. 
uh, in my counter in the client, I also want to make some changes. So let's open that up uh, and change that. Basically, I'm just saying here, OK, I want to add a parameter to this component where I can specify with what amount I want to increment uh, my counter. Uh, but that's that's basically what I changed there. Then in my index page, I want to use that counter component. Um, so let's add it here. And I think that's all that we want to do for making this a little bit more. Uh, yeah, say a little bit more of an application. So let's run it again and see what kind of changes we have. Um, so now we have this counter. Yeah, it's not the counter is coming from that WebAssembly project that we created earlier. It's no code in uh, in the server project. It's just being reused what's already there. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't do anything yet. So I can hit the click me button as much as I like, uh, but it has not been made interactive yet. And that's where those different random modes come in to play. So I basically just now said to .NET uh, and to Blazor, um, add this component. Uh, but I haven't specified in what mode I would like it to uh, be added. And then it automatically uses the uh, the server-side rendering mode. So yeah, no interactivity. How can we change that? Well, we can do that in a number of ways, but the uh, the most or the easiest way perhaps, uh, and that's also I think the most interesting way, is that you can kind of mix and match that between components and pages. So one of the things that I can do here is I can just go in here and say that I want to use WebAssembly as the render mode for this component. And with all the other uh, preparations I did, this is the only thing that I have to do to make that component interactive again. So if I'm going to run it now and go back to my uh, counter page, uh, you'll see that I have a, uh, a counter there. And because of the parameter, it's now going to increment uh, in, in, two, in two folds. And if I go into my browser tools again, uh, I can go to the network tab, uh, refresh everything, and see that there's uh, still no uh, no no web servers or uh, so, uh, sorry web socket with signal R. Um, but if we look at the application, we can see that all the code has been downloaded again. So uh, yeah, it's basically now having the code locally and run it as a uh, web assembly application by just changing that one uh, thing in the uh, in the in the component. We could also say no, and, and mind you, I'm not stopping the application. I'm not shutting anything down. I'm just going to go in runtime, say now, no, I don't want to do WebAssembly. I want to do server-side rendering. And I'll just save this. And you can see here that these code changes have now been applied successfully. So now if I go back to my application, uh, where is it here? And I just refresh the page. Uh, you should see that it's uh, still incrementing. But if I go here now, you can see that the signal R connection has been created. So for this single component, uh, because of this single component, I now have this uh, this signal R connection, uh, and I'm seeing those same uh, binary messages that I saw before. So I've now created a part of the application as a uh, uh, Blazor server application or a Blazor server component. One of the Final things that you could also do if I'm going to remove everything here again from the downloaded files, uh, the downloaded code, is go back into my application and choose the third uh, render mode that is there and just say that it's going to be using auto. And auto means basically start with the server side version, which is fast, which you don't have to download anything for, just push the HTML that's being rendered on the server. Uh, and then in the background, start downloading those. Uh, uh, WASM files, those uh, .NET assemblies into the browser cache. Again, just saving this here and waiting for the code changes to be applied. Uh, then go into my page again. And as you can see, if I refresh the page, and uh, automatically it's downloading all those, uh, those WASM files again. Uh, so you can see the same things that we saw uh, before. Uh, where it's downloading all those uh, those that that code again, uh, and it will now automatically switch from the from the uh, signal R connection to the data that has been downloaded into the browser. 
So pretty powerful, I think. Oh, really quick, one other thing that I want to show um, for this uh, application, if I go into my uh, main layout, I can say, OK, uh, I want here to have a uh, section outlet. And sections are maybe uh, familiar if you've worked with uh, uh, MVC before, where we also know sections and, and razor pages. Uh, so basically, uh, punching a hole in a in a, in a, in, a, in a page and saying, okay, at, at this place I want to insert some code. So in this case, I'm going to say, okay, this is my uh, section uh, for the footer, uh, and then on my index page I can say, okay, add uh, some content to this uh, to this section, uh, and I can also do that for the uh, for the weather page, of course. So just go here and say at the counter and what you're also seeing is that it's not recognizing that uh, uh, that component because uh, i haven't added a using attribute for it uh, but I, what i can also do is go into my import page and just say uh, okay do this for all the pages that are in my site and just use the uh, specific library for that save all the changes and go back into my application uh, let's close this up and refresh And you can see that I now have a section on the home page where this uh, is showing that uh, that specific text. And if I go to the weather page, uh, it's showing that, but then with a different type of content because that's what I said in the uh, uh, yeah in 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 the the content for this uh, section. All right, so this is um, what I had prepared for today. Um, please post any other questions in the chat. We can also follow up after the session. Uh, if you're interested, I can share source code and uh, and the slides. And uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, we don't see anything else in the chat. We'll give folks another 20, 30 seconds to uh, <laughs> type if they need to. Um, but other than that, uh, we appreciate your attendance. And uh, just a reminder that we do have uh, two more sessions uh, coming up uh, earlier in the uh, in the chat, but I'll put them back here as well. Um, so please join us for those as well. All right, and with that, we will stop recording.